All right, we're recording now. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Crossplay and Community Day panel, where we're going to talk about bringing the cloud to Kubernetes. So today we've got a panel assembled of folks who are experts in taking cloud APIs and modeling them as, as Kubernetes custom resources. Uh, I'm not sure we'll talk about later. I'm not sure if there's a consistent name for what that problem or the software that, that does that is. That's, that's an interesting thing in and of itself. So first, I just want to uh, introduce everyone that we have on the call here. We have uh, Joyce Ma from the Google Config Connector team. We've got Matt Christopher from the Azure Service Operator team. Jay Pipes, not Pipez as he tried to trick me that it was before from the uh, ACK, from the Amazon controllers for Kubernetes team. Uh, and uh, my coworker, colleague from Upbound, uh, Dan Mangum, a maintainer of the Crossplane project. So today we're gonna sort of, I guess as I said before, think about how we how we could build a consistent KRM experience on top of the cloud APIs. Um, but first I, I wanna I want to ask Matt, what, what should we call these things? Yeah, I mean, controllers, operators. Uh, yeah, at least uh, you know internally in my team we talk about this as sort of yeah like a, a cloud operator or like an Azure operator for the cloud, um, you know so, something like that. Uh, we tend to prefer the the operator nomenclature as opposed to yeah I don't know something else like a, a plugin or add on or something. But I I think you're right that I haven't heard a, a industry accepted term for for what this thing is. So Jay, yours is, um, <clears throat> you've used the, the controllers parlance, but it used to be the AWS service operator, right? Was there any real thought well, in changing to controllers yeah. or was it just a nice acronym? Uh, well, A, I'm terrible at naming things just generally. Um, I'm like super flat and explicit about everything. So yeah, these are a bunch of controllers that do AWS stuff on Kubernetes. So <laughs> it was AWS controllers for Kubernetes. Um, yeah, I, I actually like uh, Config Connector as like the 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 um, the brand or like you know because that's what it is, right? These are connector pieces between the Kubernetes API and resource model and the cloud providers APIs. Uh, so it's like connecting the configuration that's stored in Kubernetes with the cloud. Um, so I kind of, I kind of like that. Um, but yeah, uh, operator was, these are, these are more than just an operator, right? Like the connection of a CRD and a, and a custom controller. Um, they are specific types of controllers that provide that sort of integration bridge, right? Between Kubernetes land and the cloud provider land. So I like the connector uh, part of things. Yeah, me too. Which which brings me to, I th I think I'm a little hazy on the timeline, but I think Config Connector was one of the the first projects out there doing doing this kind of thing. Joyce, do you have uh, any background on sort of what inspired uh, the the GCP team, the Google Cloud team, to start Config Connector? What was the what was the uh, background behind that project being bootstrapped? Yeah, exactly. So um, basically, we've been heard from customers for years that uh, they want to move to cloud. And uh, meanwhile, they want a consistent environment like on-prem and uh, in cloud. And uh, they also prefer like consistent user experience across APIs. So in that sense, um, Imperative APIs is naturally limited on um, providing this consistent user experience. And we started looking at this declarative world. And at that time, it was back in 2018, there were like already um, deployment manager in Google in GCP that support declarative configuration of the APIs. And also there were like Terraform Google provider. Um, those are good toolings, but, mm, but I, mm, both of them has its own, own shortcomings. 
And meanwhile, oh, we see that there are already customers moving to the Kubernetes platform. So we think it's better to provide um, a more consistent user experience so they can manage their applications, not only uh, for cloud, but also for other native Kubernetes resources. So we decided that uh, we want to build something on top of Kubernetes to manage GCP. Nice. Is that is that similar for you, uh, Matt and Jay? Is that sort of the same kind of story? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, very similar uh, for us at Azure. It's you know, we wanted a Kubernetes first approach, right? Even though there are other ways to do declarative um, APIs, if if you're in the Kubernetes world, it feels kind of awkward to like have to step out of that in order to interact with the cloud, especially because you're going to be deploying your core service in Kubernetes, and then your core services dependencies like a, a DB or something, you all of a sudden you can't deploy through Kubernetes. It's, it's kind of awkward. Um, so that was one of the the big drivers for for us at least. Yeah, it's exactly the same for us. I mean, uh, we have had cloud formation, right, for well, what seems like forever, <laughs> right? And and there and there's also you know Terraform for um, another sort of declarative way of uh, driving infrastructure changes. But yeah, just like Matt said, we had customers coming to us saying, "Hey, we we prefer the Kubernetes API. We prefer the consistent." Kubernetes resource model and API machinery, and especially our devs prefer that, <laughs> right? Uh, so I, what we're, what we've struggled with really is that um, most of our customers, well, we found, they have a they have a lot of application development teams that prefer to use the Kubernetes model, um, but a lot of these customers are huge enterprises, right? And they still have these like central IT teams and a lot of those central IT teams also like to work with CloudFormation or they may use Terraform or other solutions. So um, it's sort of a mixed bag. Um, and ACK, the AWS controllers for Kubernetes is, is primarily focused on that first set, right? The application developers that prefer to use the, the Kubernetes language. Um, and we've had, yeah, some, uh, some interesting discussions, like how do you work in this hybrid environment where you've got a central IT team that's used to either imperative configuration changes or using cloud formation and things like that versus uh, the app dev teams that are uh, using and preferring the Kubernetes model. Right, right. So. Dan, do you, do you, I, I was hesitant to, not hesitant really, but every time I ask someone from AWS, hey, why did this project start? I get the same answer. It's because the customers wanted it sort of thing. And it's interesting. It was good to hear I that didn't it's do that from purpose. all the cloud providers. I know, I know. It's, 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 it's kind of the best answer to the question though, to be honest, you know, it's much better than like we thought it'd be cool or whatever, uh, which, which brings me to Dan, do you, do you know the sort of, have you done any archeological spelunking to, uh, to find out sort of the history of the uh, Crossplane project? Do you feel like you could answer the question of like, where did Crossplane come from? Yeah, I'm, I know at least from, um, I, I was aware of the project when it was initially announced and, um, but, but wasn't yet with the company. So part of uh, joining Upbound and working full-time on Crossplane was kind of like buying into the mission, I guess. Um, so I can speak to that at least. And uh, I know something that really motivated me to work on the project um, was this idea of kind of like a, a unified control plane, right? Or a common way to address uh, cloud providers. And, and, and it's grown to really more than just cloud providers, right? To address APIs. Um, Kubernetes happening to be the vehicle for facilitating that. Um, so I think, uh, you know, a, a lot of the things are similar to the things that uh, other folks on this panel have already said, uh, but with the added layer of kind of like a common interface. Um, and there were, at the beginning, there were some pieces of kind of the composability story, right? Piecing these different things together and building higher level abstractions. Um, but most of that has developed over time since the, the initial impetus. Yeah, well, my no, understanding. Nobody's I... really uh, mentioned the service broker stuff yet, uh, as far as like, Componentization or whatever, composite, uh, composition, things like that. Um, you know, we, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess I, uh, if I'm putting my archaeologist hat on, right? Uh, Crossplane and a number of other things started out sort of in the same time frame that the open service broker 
concept and community kind of started to to become a thing. And I know that the service broker has kind of fallen out of out of favor and out of out of style. But um, I, I think it's important to to bring up that topic as far as like our archaeological dig here. That's that's very true. I've got to admit, I'm somewhat uh, personally ignorant about the history of the sort of open service broker uh, uh, project and initiative. I will say for those of you who are we're recording this weeks ahead of time, but for those of you who are watching this conference now, I believe there will be a talk uh, that, that relates cross play to the open service broker and uh, the, uh, from uh, from uh, Yana to Censure, I believe, if I recall correctly. So that'll be a cool one to keep, a, keep an eye out for. But yes, that's, that's a really good one to call out that they were definitely sort of um, forging the path with regards to sort of thinking about, okay, you're deploying all these apps to Kubernetes. Now, what do you do if you want infrastructure that, that doesn't, you know, run statefully on your, on your Kubernetes clusters? Um, so just to provide a little bit more color and take this with a big grain of salt, because uh, Dan and I were, I think maybe two of the first people working on Crossplane who weren't founders of the project. Who, so, so we were, there was a period before it was open sourced when it was sort of an experimental thing that, uh, folks, folks like uh, Luke and Ilya and Jared and Basar were working on, uh, and I believe that they it actually was an accidental thing where they were trying to go build something else, and then they found it really useful to to apply something a little bit like the uh, persistent volume claim pattern to just databases and buckets and things like that, and then they built that to support the other thing that they were building, and were like, oh, hey, this is useful. We should open source this and like get this out there, sort of thing. And I believe that's where uh, where Crossplane came. So I also just going back to Dan, and I don't want to talk about Crossplane too much, but I do want to uh, get uh, ask Dan. Can you can you give a little context, Dan? Crossplane kind of approaches things a little bit differently than the other clouds, right? Like, uh, or than the clouds, I should say. So so the other projects represented on this call focus uh, on on one cloud sort of thing and, and delivering you know all the APIs of that cloud, whereas Crossplane scope is a little broader, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And and there is a lot of crossover in terms of representing uh, resources as Kubernetes objects. Um, that being said, uh, if you want to build a, a layer on top of that that allows you to um, interchange these resources as, as common building blocks, uh, you have to have some uh, interface, right, that, that all of them satisfy, right? So just like if you were um, doing object-oriented programming or something like that, if you want to be able to change things out, um, at like for like, uh, you need to be able to address them in the same way. So Crossplane uh, has a common runtime as well as some common embedded types uh, that it puts into all of its objects. Um, so I, I know Jay actually mentioned earlier today um, that it, it's kind of like uh, the ACK uh, types have uh, kind of the top level spec of a resource, um, you know, the fields that are actually going directly to AWS. Whereas with Crossplane, we kind of have a container for those sorts of fields um, and then the common fields on top of that. So just as an example of some things that uh, would be common between resources, uh, the way they reference each other, the way they produce connection secrets, the way they report whether they're ready or healthy, uh, those are all things that we need to be consistent with um, so that we can you know, compose them into a higher level abstraction and aggregate up uh, some of those components. Yeah, I think another place where sort of cross planes approach gets interesting uh, goes back to what we were talking about before with regards to potentially integrating with like legacy systems and things like that, because we opened up the, uh, you know, there's only so much that's implemented so far, but, you know, we just released like a vSphere provider, for example. So you can mix and match your, you know, cloud of choice with maybe, and, you know, maybe your cloud of choice is vSphere. I don't want to paint vSphere as purely legacy stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, if you do have a different environment sort of thing, let's say if you're moving from, from Azure to AWS or vice versa, you can, you can kind of do both consistently or theoretically if you were using, um, we, uh, we don't have a ton of uh, old school bare metal stuff. We have like an Equinix provider, but I don't really think they're very old school. So, but if you were on bare metal, you could hypothetically have a Kubernetes, uh, sorry, a cross plane provider that you can sort of mix and match there. Or you could imagine like having a, you know, a provider that just goes and runs Terraform or CloudFormation for you if you, if you wanted to. So this, this kind of gets back a little bit. I think one thing that Crossplane has, has really focused on uh, is the, is thinking about the separation of concerns between sort of like platform teams doing part of the job and, uh, and then sort of the consumers of, of sort of platform teams or the customers of platform teams doing another part of the job. Is that a dynamic? 
uh, Joyce, that you see for Config Connector users? Who are, who are the main people who you see using Config Connector? Is it sort of mostly SREs or mostly sort of SREs sort of just offer Config Connector as a service so that the average application developer, the person who writes deployment might also write a Cloud SQL instance or something like that? Yeah. So um, we uh, identify our customer, uh, our target customers are like platform teams and platform administrators who are like design, designing, building and uh, setting up their centralized infrastructure. And I think those are our main customers and they might create a, a a general infrastructure for the entire organization, or they might create uh, infrastructure on demand for the uh, application teams. So basically, we consider those are our tar target customers. Uh, on the other hand, application teams can definitely use us, but I guess um, it really depends on like what they, how they like design their infrastructure or how they de design their own workflow. But uh, from our perspective, like platform admins are, are our target customers. Makes sense. And I think I've seen, I, I know that Google uh, has some examples uh, on, on GitHub of um, building abstractions on top of cloud, uh, uh, sorry, on top of config connector types. But uh, Google typically seems to prefer to, to do those abstractions client side, right? I think I've seen like there's tools like KBT, uh, the way there's some examples of how you can have sort of use KBT to render out some some tools. Is that sort of something that, that maybe would be more focused to application developers rather than uh, platform teams? Um, yeah, so I think like uh, CAPT is part of, it's definitely like a uh, like a new thing that is used to integrate with other toolings on the like Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, the thing about uh, like Config Connector is it's used to ma mainly manage the like manage the control plan of the resources, and uh, for a lot of the application use cases. Uh, they might be focused on more on data plan. And so that's why we consider like uh, managing the infrastructure is the main use case. For example, uh, we have examples of creating resource hierarchy, which is basically create the organization, create the folders and create different folders for different teams, set up IAM permissions and uh, set up networking connections. So those are actually something we find the config connector will be really useful because it's providing the consistent template consistent user experience and the similar infrastructure can be set up for different teams with several configurations by a variable supported by capped so also so the entire workflow can be simplified and uh, like yeah so I want to I want to sort of ask a, a similar variant of this question to Matt because uh, one whenever I think about managing um, what we in Crosslink called high fidelity or maybe a more common way to put it would be sort of the granular uh, uh, custom resources that map to a cloud API. A lot of folks come to this problem thinking, oh, I want a database, and there's just going to be an API that is you know my database, and you know in, in in some cases, uh, looking at UJ, uh, you know, the API for an S3 bucket is like 25 different API calls, um, you know, because it is 19, the grandfather. just for the update code <laughs> paths, yes. 19 separate API calls to update a bucket attribute. Anyway, go ahead. But so, so Matt, I always use Azure as an example here because Azure does something that I think is really good where when you create a, in, as far as I'm aware, when you create a, a Postgres SQL Server, for example, um, it will usually uh, it will not allow any traffic, and then you have to go and create some firewall rules uh, to either allow a virtual net or uh, or just an IP range to, to access it, which is you know secure by default, which is good. But then it changes the 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 problem uh, from just going to give me a database to give me a database and configure some network security, and you know potentially go make a virtual network or something like that if you need to. Um, so is this also something that the ASO uses a uh, sort of 
pretty comfortable doing this sort of people who are infrastructure types who are using this yeah so so for the most part we you know people who are using aso are as you say exactly you know they understand what resource what resources are being deployed and they sort of are like if not platform administrators at least they're they're bridging the gap between sort of a platform they're like the platform admin for their team right um so mm -hmm. we have some customers where like they've set up ASO and they're using, you know, Kubernetes RBAC and stuff such that they're delegating platform administration to an individual team within their company. Um, and each team sort of does their own platform admin. And then the ASO is maintained by the, the core team, but they don't, they don't concern themselves with, uh, what a particular team in their company is deploying they just give them you know sort of carte blanche to, to deploy whatever they like as long as it's you know in their namespace um and so yeah the the general case is that customers sort of understand how to configure these things um, and one of the things that they like about sort of the operator pattern and and aso is hey like I need to create like six of these things or whatever, as you say, like the Postgres server, uh, a DB, some firewall rules, um, et cetera. And it's, it's really nice in Kubernetes to be able to do that by just like applying, you know, six, six resources all at the same time. Like you don't have to worry about ordering. You don't have to worry about like, does this come before that? It's, it's sort of just to make it so, and then you wait a little bit and then it's all there. Uh, and so that's one of like the big selling points, I think of, of not just ASO, but sort of the, the general pattern that Kubernetes is espousing is like, Hey, you don't have to concern yourself with, uh, you know, Jay mentioned there's these 19 APIs, but presumably like you don't have to think about that when you're, when you're actually interacting uh, at sort of the CRD level, which is, which is a, a big win. Exactly. Yeah, I mean... Just change the spec <laughs> and let the controller deal with all the ugliness behind the scenes, right? And which S3 update attribute API call it's going to make, you know? Um, hide all of that implementation, that imperative implementation goop in the controller and allow the developer experience to just be one of, just tell me your desired state and that's it. So Jay, speak, I, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I was reading uh, a few weeks back now on the uh, on the ACK uh, GitHub repo and was, was doing a bit of research myself to answer this, like who is the target audience of ACK? And was I correct in thinking that ACK also has a bit of a bent toward letting people build higher order things on top of ACK stuff? Like, is there a, is there a thought there of like, hey, someone might want to build their own controller and, and pull in some ACK controllers? Or did I, did I sort of not quite get that one? You are muted, Jay. Oh, Jay's uh, experiencing technical difficulties. So let me, while he figures that out, let me let me roll on back to uh, back to Dan. So now, sort of, it's interesting to hear that, sort of, from uh, from ASO and Config Connectors perspective, um, we're mostly seeing platform teams or SRE folks being the the people sort of doing the end to end, spinning up the infrastructure, sort of thing. Dan Crossplane sort of uh, has this approach of, of separation of concerns. Do you want to give me a bit of context around what Crossplane does there? Yeah, absolutely. And and honestly, it's it's very compatible uh, with what both Matt and Joyce have said so far in that uh, the actual granular, as we call them, managed resources are things that we don't expect you know, non-infrastructure admins to interact with because they're generally pretty complex, right? And understanding how they work together requires a, a fair amount of background knowledge. Um, and that really informs the composition model, which I was alluding to earlier. Um, another thing that uh, is kind of a, maybe the, the most controversial topic, I'll say between uh, Crossplane and some other projects um, is the cluster scoping uh, of those managed resources, right? So um, all of these managed resources, the granular ones exist at the cluster scope while, while most other projects, whether they're you know managing infrastructure or doing other, uh, are at the namespace scope, right? For isolation and RBAC uh, privileges and that sort of thing. Um, the reason why Crossplane takes that approach is because the composition model allows you to define that abstraction and expose it at the namespace. Um, so then you're able to put the permission permissioning, you're able to raise it to the level of abstraction, right? So you're able to say, um, developers interact with this, uh, you know, friendly interface or this friendly resource uh, that has very simple fields that map to things that we want uh, and enforce policy we want. Um, and we can govern their ability to do that at the namespace scope. 
um, but then it renders out those resources at the cluster scope. And that's where the infrastructure admins um, do those kind of operations with which config connector and ASO, you know, are providing them the ability to do as well um, and, and actually control those those granular specific resources. Thanks, Dan. So we've still lost Jay. I'm just going to, oh, here he comes. <laughs> Welcome back, Jay. Oh, you didn't miss too much. Zoom crashed. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's keep rolling on now to some of the, the sort of maybe more interesting to, to those of us on the call, at least, uh, technical stuff. Um, Matt, what, what would you say is sort of the biggest challenge of, of building out something like ASO? either technically or logistically, organizationally. Right. Um, I mean, I would say that these two things sort of go hand in hand. It's it's consistency and scaling to the number of resources that there that there are in the cloud, right? And it's the 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 more you try to scale sort of sort of manually or by throwing more people at it or whatever, the harder it becomes to sort of maintain that consistency, as I'm sure you you know everybody on the call is familiar with. And so it's this constant tension between like how fast can we go, how many things can we support, but then are we giving a uniform experience? Are we giving, uh, you know, I think Dan mentioned earlier, like it's the same. I want to be able to look at the right properties and see state. I, uh, I want to be able to do references the same um, and all that. And so I would say like, that's one of the, the biggest challenges is that constant tension between these two things. And of course, you know, the team that we have uh, working on ASO is just, it's such a small fraction compared to the team in Azure that's building new things and shipping new APIs that, you know, if you look at it from sort of a, a person hours perspective, there's just no way that, you know, like five or six of us could ever keep up with however many, you know, like thousands of developers there are producing new APIs in Azure. And so we've got to come up with some way to do something about that disconnect. Um, and that's one of the, the big challenges. Joyce, I, I know I've, I've spoken to people on the Config Connector team and heard similar things. Do you agree that that's sort of the biggest challenge or is there something else that, uh, that, that you'll uh, find trickier? Yeah, I completely agree. Like consistency is always um, a big problem or big challenge, I would say, is it comes together with uh, scaling because the more resource you support, the more edge cases you are running to and the more features you need to support to cover those edge cases. So it's really hard. Uh, the lucky part for us is uh, we are built on top of declarative client libraries which they communicate with service teams directly and we work closely with the declarative library team to make sure like they feature or the resources they support aligns with uh, our customers requests and then they can probably delegate their own request to the service team so it's like there's a layer in between us and the, the api teams so dan what's what's this like as a maintainer of crossplane who is you know we, we have almost the same problem but another layer up i think right yeah, that's exactly right. I was going to just respond with hard and next question, but uh, it, it's definitely very challenging. Uh, all of the things that have already been mentioned are, are applicable for us as well uh, with the added uh, part of we we are not at these companies, right? So some some uh, internal things we don't have access to, of course. Um, and, you know, we also, well, no one can right now, but theoretically in a, in a future time when we're not in a pandemic, uh, be able to walk down the hall and knock on someone's door and ask them how an API works. Um, that being said, uh, we definitely had awesome partnership with the folks on this call right here um, in being able to share some of the generation uh, of kind of the uh, manual steps for creating these resources. Um, so specifically with AWS, um, ACK and provider AWS for Crossplane um, currently share a code generation pipeline, which definitely uh, helps accelerate both projects as, you know, they have the context um, for, you know, understanding how these APIs work at an intimate level. Um, and we're able to contribute back based on our experiences as well. So that's definitely a factor. Um, and then one thing we haven't touched on, which uh, I definitely see as a, as a um, open source maintainer as a big um, component is community, right? Uh, when you get more folks working on things, um, you know, whatever their background, uh, it's a huge benefit for, for driving progress. Um, so especially since um, Crossplane has joined CNCF and had its 1.0 release and that sort of thing, 
uh, we've seen a lot of folks just from, you know, all of the world, all different backgrounds, all different companies uh, come together and say, you know, I'd like to learn how to do this because it, it scratches an itch that I have. Um, and having that kind of open community uh, definitely supports that. And, um, and, you know, hopefully those folks that come along and contribute can also grow in the community and take on larger leadership roles and, and take something away from contributing as well. Yeah, that's that's kind of one of our big approaches to scaling is, is scaling the community to scale with the amount of work of, of building building this stuff out. The, the whole consistency uh, thing is is really interesting to me. I think, you know, we talked about why people like to use uh, Kubernetes to manage their infrastructure. And I think part of sort of what we touched on there was roughly just tool inconsistency. They're probably already using Kubernetes to do other stuff to manage their applications. But I think part of it is because people like the, the Kubernetes resource model. KRM and I think people like it because it's a very consistent, predictable API. And I think a lot of what we've all sort of seen, you know, crossplane, we call it the XRM or the, the, the crossplane resource model, where we're just, it's a, you know, a superset of, of that. And we're just saying, hey, what if we make this more consistent and more opinionated? The people are like, oh, we like that. <laughs> um, but then there's also an interesting thing where hypothetically you've now got, uh, you know, when we're, when, we're uh, when someone comes to write a new crossplane provider, there's different layers at which you could ask them to be consistent. You could just say, hey, you can go write this provider in Erlang for all we care, just have a consistent API. And there are trade-offs there, right, that you need a big enough community for that provider where everyone's gonna be uh, coming and learning Erlang potentially, or like using a different tool set, building new libraries, all that kind of thing, but, but sure. And especially if that's an open source community we might want to have that flexibility or you could also you, you know take the approach that we've come closer to taking saying we actually want you to build providers mostly in a specific way using go using these libraries etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm guessing sort of i know joyce you said that you've got sort of dcl uh which which i believe is like a go uh, library right um jay at, at, at amazon is everyone do you think you're going to get everyone sort of pretty consistently building controllers just using the ack style sort of thing do you ever have issues with people saying no i really want to go do this with java or something like that um no we don't really have any uh issues with that i think it's uh, our our biggest challenges are primarily people-based right I, I mean ack is a, is a set of service controllers right um uh that one for each of the service API, so one for S3, RDS, et cetera. And each of those services is backed by people at AWS, right? And those service teams, some have a very long history uh, of doing things their own way. Some have um, a very short history and are like very comfortable working in the open source community. Some aren't. Um, so yeah it's it's been a challenge uh, bridging across those different service teams f for me personally uh, i mean it's a challenge i welcome but it's definitely been a challenge right because i have to sort of explain how kubernetes works in addition to <laughs> you know like hey what are our needs from an ack perspective uh we generate the controller right for the for the different resources in that service api and then we work with the service team to build tests and and that kind of thing um, so, yeah, uh, the, the variety of knowledge about Kubernetes and container ecosystems within the service teams at AWS has has been uh, a challenge. I'll just put it that way. Yeah. So we're, we're pretty much at time, but just to wrap us up, I want to, you know, we've been talking about technical challenges and things like that. I want to just do a quick round the room and I'm going to ask everyone to just give me a, you know, one or two sentence answer of uh, what what are you most excited about on your project at the moment or like what what's what's most interesting to you if you know if it's not a feature a technical challenge or something so uh start with joyce what's what's excites you the most about config connector at the moment or what you're working on oh uh, yeah so um i think the most exciting part is like customer can actually use config connector to uh manage google res uh, manage gcp resources like native kubernetes resources it's like um like i see i've seen a lot of like customer calls about that and it's also amazing that we can keep full fidelity of those underlying gcp resources so those are something i'm really excited about because that's exactly the goal of config connector and i'm so excited to see customer actually feel it yeah yeah it's really exciting to see this sort of vision that we've all been working on like becoming real and being used in production environments 
How about you, Matt? A similar answer, or do you have a different take? Uh, well, one of the, the, the things that we're sort of uh, incubating in ASO right now is Azure has uh, ARM and it has specs for all of the management plane operations are in open API. And so one of the things that we're working on is, you know, I mentioned the scaling challenges and the consistency challenges, and we're sort of um, pretty close to an alpha now where we're planning on generating, uh, as sort of Jay mentioned, uh, AWS is doing as well, uh, the controllers for all of these uh, management plane resources from these open API specs. And so I'm really excited to sort of hopefully be able to uh, knock down one block on that challenge of, hey, can, you know, consistency, scalability, we've got this thing that we can generate using open API. And uh, actually, you know, like 90 or 80% of the Azure resources, uh, we'll just be able to code generate. And then of course, we still have to solve testing and, and all of these other problems. But at least that's one big step toward a, a consistent experience across a large number of resources that doesn't involve tons and tons of manual effort and you know people massaging each and every one. Um, we're sort of lucky in Azure because there's that uh, uniform way to deploy through through ARM uh, and all the specs are there. So it's just a you know question of writing the code to turn it into Kubernetes resources. Nice, and I, I want to give a shout out. One of the things that I'm most excited about in, in, in our whole space in general uh, is uh, Matt and his colleagues over in New Zealand put together a little proposal on how to do versioning of Kubernetes resources relative to cloud resources, which is really well thought out, really, really great read. I recommend it if you're a nerd about this stuff like me. Uh, Jay, how about you? Well, I think there's two things I'm most, most excited about. Um, from a user perspective of um, either cross-plane users or um, users of ACK individual service controllers, I, I'm really excited about bringing a consistent way of interacting with some AWS service resources um, using the Kubernetes API machinery and, and Kubernetes resource model. I think that that consistency um, is has been asked for for a long time by uh, application developers who prefer Kubernetes. So I'm super excited about that and just the consistency in general. The other thing I'm really excited about is actually using ACK as a mechanism to bring the world of open source development to internal AWS service team engineers. Um, the not only the uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem and sort of like how that works and CNCF projects like Crossplane, but just generally getting some service team engineers at AWS out of their shell and and using sort of like more upstream open development tooling and and build tool chains um, and just getting them comfortable with contributing to open source projects. Uh, that's I like personally uh, very important to me. So yeah, that's that's what makes jazzes me up, gets me in the office each day. Yeah, I can totally empathize with that. I, I you know, not that, not that they're in any way bad at open source, but I spent my first five years, six years of my career at Google. Uh, and it was a bit of a bit of a culture shock to leave Google and, you know, be using the open source equivalent of all of this, you know, internal tooling sort of things. So it is, I totally get, you know, exposing the average engineer to like more of how stuff's done in the outside world is, is always fun. Dan, and last but not least, uh, what are you most excited about with Crossplane? So this is, I guess, a bit of a deviation from the other answers. Um, but one of the parts of Crossplane that uh, doesn't get focused on too much, but I'm I'm particularly kind of partial to is the package manager, um, which kind of has some opinionated um, uh, workflows for how you can install and manage and version CRDs and update packages and roll them back and forth. Um, and, and a proposed kind of extension to this in the future uh, is the ability to support uh, essentially functions. So right now we have providers, which are basically controllers and CRDs. We have configurations, which are uh, just YAML objects um, that get installed into the cluster. Um, and then functions could really lower the barrier to entry for folks um, authoring uh, some of this uh, kind of specific functionality. Uh, so you could imagine day two operations or disaster recovery or migration. Those could all be things that could be packaged into small functions. Um, and there's a lot of innovation happening in the function space in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And also um, more and more folks are using to uh, moving to um, things like Lambda and, and things like that. Um, so, you know, providing that interface to, to interact with this kind of ecosystem that we've built um, of, of cloud provider resources as Kubernetes objects is something that uh, I think could be a really powerful model. Yeah, I'm super excited about that too. 
All right, thanks everyone. I think we're pretty much at time, so I'm gonna uh, stop the recording now. Thank you all again. <laughs>